going to start with the show me the data section as usual. We're going to show you a lot of data on focus, flow, creativity, productivity. Um, some, some great new studies have come out. We're going to talk about those. Uh, we also have on our leadership guest, Stephen Cutler. Very excited to have him on. He is the author of Stealing Fire. Uh, his new book, The Last Tango in Cyberspace. We'll be talking with him. And we'll also be talking with uh, Ranjani uh, Marala Dahara said that right about her new career and how she got into her career what she does day to day and how she improves her performance so again thank you all for being here great to see you on confirmation lisa mary are we live publicly looks like we are i'm going to share my screen very quickly we like to give you all a show up bonus or a chance to join one of our webinars early uh, for being here live with us so i'm going to show my screen and if want to learn more about leveraging LinkedIn, you can go to this page. Go to chiefyscientist.com PhD dash LinkedIn dash strategy. Put in your name and email and we will send you an invite for free to tomorrow's advanced training on LinkedIn. This is specifically for PhDs. If you're looking to get a job and you're watching this, uh, this webinar will help you. 12 LinkedIn strategies for, for, for getting hired in industry for PhDs only. I do want to recommend you go check out our recent blog article titled How to Kickstart Your Industry Job Search by Networking During Your PhD or Postdoc. So if you just go to cheekyscientist.com slash blogs, you can read all of our blog articles here about advancing your career as a PhD, getting your first or next industry job. Uh, we also scour the internet for the best articles for getting a job, whether it's how to write a resume, networking, interviews, transferable skills, uh, top industry positions, increasing your business acumen, your performance, all of that is here on the blog uh, to under our best industry transition articles of the week. We do that weekly. Make sure you check it out. You don't have to go anywhere else. We collate all of these articles together for you. Okay, so very excited to get started today. We have a lot of great guests on. Um, I wanna say hello to our team very, very quickly. So I'm going to bring Mary on really quick. Mary will be joining us a bit later. We're going to do a LinkedIn review and some interview training for our members only. Hello, Mary. How are you? I'm great, Isaiah. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Please say hi to Mary in the chat box if you can see and hear her okay. I want to bring on Lisa, too. Lisa, how are you? I'm here. <laughs> Lisa's there. All right. Good. Hi. Great to see you on, Lisa. Thanks for joining. And Jeanette, who's going to be coming on with us maybe right now for the Show Me the Data section. Hi, Jeanette. How are you? Hello, Isaiah. I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. All right. So please say hello to Lisa and to Jeanette as well. Our team makes this possible. We're very, very excited um, to uh, have all of our guests on. So I know that we have Stephen Cutler on. Mary, do you want to check with Stephen to see if he wants to come on early or later? Um, he says that he has about 20 minutes. So, Stephen, if you're listening, we can bring you on now um, uh, before the show me the data section. That is that is totally fine. So, I'll check with Mary here if that's what you prefer. If that works, um, we have a short show me the data section. So, Mary, just let me know if you want to bring Stephen on earlier. Jeanette will jump into the show me the data, and if we need to jump on with Stephen earlier, we will. So, again, great to see all of you. We're going to jump to the show me the data section which is here, and we like to start because we're PhDs, and because Stephen and our guests um, love this kind of data, we thought it would be smart to show you what's out there in terms of focus, flow, performance, some of the things that are known, uh, and then help you get, a, get some context for what we're gonna be talking about today. So this first article, Jeanette, is titled, Higher Media Multitasking Activities Associated with Smaller Gray Matter Density in the anterior cingulate cortex. And for those of you listening by audio, uh, on the left we're looking at some brain scan images uh, that show some uh, small yellow dots in these anterior cingulate cortex regions. And then we have a graph on the right where the y-axis is showing the size of these regions and then the right is showing uh, how much media multitasking uh, these individuals do. And we see a trend line that's uh, a linear line so what can we, what conclusions can we draw from this, Jeanette? Yeah, 
So this was pretty interesting uh, paper, and what they found was that when they looked at this MMI score, which is the amount that a person multitasks with their media, yes. um, and the more that they are doing this multitasking, it's actually causing a decrease in the size of the gray matter density in their anterior cingulate cortex. So in this particular part of their brain, um, they're, they're correlated where the more you multitask, the smaller this part of your brain is. So multitasking is actually shrinking the size of your brain, the part of your brain. Well, they because they didn't they didn't prove causation, right. right? Because they didn't do like a timed. You would need to do like a time scale test with these participants to see if more multitasking caused even smaller reduction, right? But they showed that there was a correlation between these two items. Which is um, interesting. In small, so whether one causes the other wasn't. And then just, just for uh, understanding purposes, what is this part of the brain important for? Yeah, so the, the paper points out that it's important for discrimination between what's important and what's not important. So making yes. those decisions about where you should focus your energy. It's also known to play a role in controlling your social behavior, regulating how you act in social situations and contributing to um, emotional intelligence. Yeah, fantastic. And so this is, something that we've shown you a lot of data of before basically multitasking is bad but why when you multitask you're not prioritizing well or discriminating well as the, the article says and then at the same time it shows a correlation between uh, the more you multitask to be even worse at prioritizing so it makes you prioritize less effectively and prioritization is key um, Mary yeah I think Stephen's ready to come on for his interview Okay, great. So we can jump in now. He told me that he could show me the data. We could go through some of the data. Um, so let's let's finish this one up. Then we'll okay. go through the data. I just asked a question, which was, are there, were there emotional control issues in that study as well, Jeanette? Uh, yeah. So the emotional intelligence part you mentioned at the end, Jeanette, you had less emotional control, right? Yes, less emotional regulation and the ability to control. That's because that's what that area was associated with is regulating your social and emotional behaviors um, and so you lose control over that the when that's smaller so you turn into more of a spaz basically to some extent. <laughs> so it, it is important though because not only can you prioritize less effectively and uh, the data for the most part is correlative but it's important um, you prioritize less effectively but you also um, don't make as uh, you don't manage your emotions as well and we have we have some other things that So the second one here, and we just have a few more figures to go, cognitive control in media multitaskers. So we're staying on this topic of multitasking and how well you can control your cognitive faculty uh, keys. So we're looking at three different figures here. The one on the left, just to go through the Y and the X axes uh, for those of you listening by audio, uh, we have performance on the Y axis of the first figure, number of distractors on the X axis, mean response time on the y-axis of the second figure, and then uh, the condition, whether no distractors or distractors on the x-axis of the second figure, and then for the third figure, false alarm rate on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis, uh, the task type, two back or three back, which we will explain. So Jeanette, for this first figure, we're seeing performance, number of distractors, we have a low uh, multitasking group and a high multitasking group. And the high multitasking group, it looks like as there are more distractors, they perform uh, less effectively. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. You can see that the line drops down um, as you get towards, they go from zero to four or six distractors during this particular focus task. And the more distractors there were, those people who are high multitaskers weren't able to maintain the high level of performance when there's more distractions. Basically, like we we're saying, they can't discriminate or they're struggling to discriminate what's important and what's not important in the task. Perfect. And we talked a little bit about the, uh, you know, the, I guess the span of the uh, statistical significance bar here. And yeah. they mentioned this in the paper. Yeah. So they look at the two, um, uh, the one third and one third of this like standard deviation bell curve. So they've looked at the third of people who are like low multitaskers 
and high multitaskers who are one standard deviation away from the mean. So they've taken this whole chunk of people mm. and that's what they've um, examined. And so this makes a difference in the amount of variation you're seeking. So they could have shifted that even more to look at like the even more extreme high and low multitaskers. You might've seen a change in that bar. Um, but in this, you're looking at a large group of people who are only one standard deviation away from the mean, and you're still seeing this difference. I think that's what's kind of important about it is it's not even, they're not looking at super extremes, right. and you're still seeing a change. And then for the second chart, uh, quickly, we're looking at response time versus, you know, no distractors, distractors. Can you explain this? Yeah, yeah. So you can, it's the same sort of thing with this. They were asked to perform a task, and they got slower when there was more distractions, um, all of everybody got slower, right? Which sort of makes sense if there's someone like yelling at you, you're gonna be slower when you're doing something. Mm -hmm. But it was more um, probably more obvious and they got more slow when they were the um, high multitasking group. High multitasking, right. And then finally for the false alarm rate, so two back, three back, this one's interesting. Can you can explain this experiment briefly? Yeah, of course. So this one, they were asked to recall um, Two back and three back means that they were asked to recall the key, it was a key letter. It was a letter that they had to remember. That was like the target letter from two or three tasks ago. Yes. So they had to recall the data from two or three times ago. And so you can see like two tasks ago that both groups were equal, they were the same. Um, but then when you drew it even further back and they had to focus even more clearly on something, like one specific thing when there's a lot of stuff um, that, that would, would be distracting them. And in the middle, like they had to filter through the task they were doing, the task before, and focus on that third one. Um, it was more difficult for those people who are the high multitaskers right. to do that. And they were, they were giving more false alarms, which means that they were cr clicking things that they thought were correct, that were incorrect. Okay. So they weren't even doing it right. So it's yeah. fast. Uh, no, but this, this is good. I, I think this is important. So we're talking about a lot of things here. So uh, let's take a step back and realize, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about distraction as it relates to performance, right? We'll keep bringing it back to performance, but also creativity and focus overall. And I like what Daria said, you know, many people hire multitaskers. I want to make the distinction between multitaskers and doing a lot of tasks. Okay, it's different. Like you can get a lot done and you can perform at a very high level and go through a lot of different tasks. That's different than multitasking where you're you're changing in between tasks before they're closed out. And that's what causes the problems um, from, from what most of the literature says. And we see things, uh, we saw this recently in a previous radio show where it takes about 20 minutes or so uh, to get back to your, high, your, your peak levels of focus after changing a task. Um, so there, there is a problem there. And it just, it ends up weighing on your mental energy levels to the point of causing false alarms, decreasing your performance overall, and so on. So this next uh, figure is, is very interesting. It talks specifically about uh, flow state, and I, I love this title. It's the, from the Flow Genome Project, and uh, the title is Examining the Relationship Between Flow and Creativity. All right, so we've talked about performance, focus, but what about creativity, coming up with new concepts, connecting things in, in different ways? Or, or increasing performance further. Um, FSS here means flow short scale. Um, flow is measured using the flow short scale. This is a nine item quantitative self-report questionnaire designed to measure the level of flow experienced by an individual. And so on the chart, we're just looking at the FSS score on the y-axis and the most ex uh, creative experience score on the x-axis. We see a blue trend line, right, that has a, a steeper slope than a, a green trend line, both going in the same directions. What does all of this data mean? Yeah, so the, the big picture for this figure is that the higher the FFS score, so the more that someone is in flow, you can see that that's, as you move along the creativity axis, that goes up. Right. So when you have more of a flow state, you are more creative. And we see that with the grouping of all of those dots or the crosses up at the top right corner of the graph. Right. Higher flow state is more creative. That's what a person felt right. like. They felt, if I'm in more in flow, I am more creative. Exactly. And for those, uh, again, listening by audio, we, you know, the green bar, which has, which starts at a, at higher uh, on, on the, um, the 
base of the graph and it finishes higher um, as you as you move down the x-axis this is in flow priming right so genetic just means like in the flow state or in this priming state of the flow correct yeah they were basically told to think about the project maybe we i can be corrected because this is from flow genome project which is associated with our guest today yes. but from what i understood is that this is people who were told to think about being in flow beforehand right. whereas the other people weren't told about this process so it's like they're priming them to get themselves into flow and to think in this way versus people who weren't given that kind of priming or that preemptive information about the study which again ties together a lot of interesting things we've talked about in the past few weeks um, so you know uh, what it shows is there is this correlation between being in the flow state based on this fss score and being more creative overall but also priming yourself to get into this state um, can get you into the flow state faster and make you more creative faster, right? So yeah, it's like having the right mindset. We talk about that all the time, and that's what that is. It's like getting yourself into the right mindset so that you can reach these um, higher levels of thinking and flow and creativity. Exactly. And the last thing we want to do, just to make it super practical uh, for all of you, is the skills companies need most, right? So you want to. You're thinking, okay, well, why do I care about creativity? It's already come up in the chat box. Performance, etc. Um, creativity is at the top of the list. This is just one list uh, from LinkedIn, uh, but it, it can't, it, some, some of you have brought this list to us, asked us for, for these lists. There's a variety of them, but if you look at the data overall, what companies are asking for more and more is creative individuals, right? They, want, they care about things like time management, other transferable skills like collaboration, adaptability, but creativity is crucial. And how do you increase creativity? It's very different than just thinking that you have to, you know, switch through as, and get through as many tasks as possible. Um, sometimes performance and creativity uh, aren't, are linked in uh, unexpected ways as well. So I think this yeah. sets the, the framework up here. Any closing thoughts, Jeanette? I just had one thought was that we often talk about innovation as well, and innovation is creativity. Yes. And so I think maybe a lot of times we see these lists of innovations at the top, so maybe there's just someone using a thesaurus thinking, what's another word for innovation? And so they've chosen creativity because they're very similar and when you get this creativity, because sometimes that might not be easy to pitch to an employer, right? Like, I'm creative. Right. They might be like, okay. <laughs> but if you tell them, like, I'm innovative and I have these skills, that's really something that employers are looking for. Exactly. Well said. And I think that's the perfect uh, perfect transition for us to go talk to Stephen Kotler here. Jeanette, thank you very much. Please thank Jeanette in the chat box for taking the time to go with us through the data. There's a lot that you could cover. Um, in in flow, a lot that we could go through in terms of focus, performance, creativity. We just wanted to show you again some simple concepts. The simple takeaway is is that these flow states, these certain states, these certain mental states, will make you more creative, make you more innovative. And uh, on the practical level, employers, business people, they want you to be more creative because it can increase your performance or lead to uh, you know a breakthrough in your system. Things that will overall help a company be successful and then we show the tie-ins between things that actually can dampen uh, your creativity dampen your performance and focus which is so task switching multitasking uh, so I do want to bring on our next guest and I'm going to go through his bio we're very fortunate to have on Stephen Kotler I'm going to show his bio here we'll look at his LinkedIn page his home page he has a lot of free uh, resources online he's written several books he is a New York Times best-selling author and award-winning journalist and the co-founder and director of research at the Flow Genome Project, and that's what that last figure that we looked at um, was from. He is one of the world's leading experts on high performance. His most recent work, Still in Fire, well, one of his most recent works, uh, Still in Fire, was a national bestseller and nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, it documents an underground revolution in peak performance that is rapidly going mainstream, fueling a trillion dollar economy and forcing us to rethink how we lead more satisfied and productive and meaningful lives. Um, for all of you on LinkedIn, which is almost everyone here attending and, and for those of you that are watching us uh, on Facebook or YouTube uh, you can connect with Stephen on his LinkedIn page here we'll put the, these links in the chat box if you do reach out make sure you add a kind note about seeing him on the radio show and please check out his website at stephencotler.com for those of you listening by audio it's s-t-e-v-e-n-k-o-t-l-e-r.com and we'll put these links in the chat box I highly recommend going out and purchasing Stealing Fire right now. You can purchase it on Amazon here. Um, Stealing Fire. Uh, this is a, a nonfiction book. A lot of great research here. And Stephen's doing great work. Um, with these, with these resources too. So I uh, highly recommend checking.
talking about this book. We'll come back to it later. And if you want to read some fiction, his new book is coming out very soon, Last Tango in Cyberspace. Uh, I, I want to say thanks to Stephen for sending this over. This was a, a very, I don't read a lot of fiction to be honest, but I, I was reading this and I couldn't put it down, so uh, I do recommend checking it out. Especially if you have trouble sleeping, reading a little bit of fiction helps me sleep. It's been shown to help people sleep. This is a, a great piece of fiction to read. So hello Stephen, how are you? Thanks for joining us today. Did you just tell everybody that my book is going to <laughs> Did I just have it? <laughs> uh, so it'll help you, yeah. It, it, it is a great book. Fiction, it, it's the one thing that just calms my brain down, and you don't see a lot of people writing both nonfiction and fiction uh, especially well. So uh, kudos to you on that, and thank you for thank you. Thank you for the book. I appreciate it. So great to have you on. I just wanted to start with, you know, we have, we have a lot of people on who are in these different life transition points, and they're trying to become, trying to perform better in a brand new area. And so I thought we could start by talking about your transition. I, I know that you you recently went from being a journalist to co-founding uh, the, the, this genome project, which is quite a jump, right? Uh, you, you've done a lot in writing and journalism. So when you've gone through these transition points, what initiated them and then what has helped you make the transition no matter what the new topic was you were getting into? Those are interesting questions. Um, I think, so one answer, uh, I have found, Einstein famously said, you can't solve the problem you're trying to solve at the level you're at. Mm. I find oftentimes that's very true in a career. So sometimes, for example, when I wanted to, this is going to sound really weird, but when I wanted to solidify my career as a book writer, I started a dog sanctuary because it got my mind, I was so focused on the thing that I was trying to fix and my career and everything else that I was too tight. And there's a direct correlation the amount of norepinephrine, which is essentially anxiety in your system and your ability to think creatively. Think about it as a spectrum, right? When you have a ton of norepinephrine in your system, you're in fight or flight, and you can you, you have two options. You can fight or you can flee, right? Or you can freeze, which is what happens when your brain gets both signals at once and you're paralyzed, right? On the opposite end of that spectrum is flow, where you're your peak performance and you can go in any direction if you're, you're at your best. So the more norepinephrine in your system, the less creative you can be. It basically shrinks the size of the pattern, rec the database search by the pattern recognition system, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah. oftentimes if you're really focused on a problem, right, you're not getting creative ideas. None of the insights are coming in. So every, when I'm really stuck and I want to, you know, solve something, I often start another enterprise that's bigger, harder, more complicated um, along those lines. So a lot of what you're looking at in my career is me actually trying to solve a different problem than the one it looks like I'm trying to solve. That's fasc yeah. that's fascinating. And I, I think a lot of you have experienced this where you've been totally, uh, most of you, you've been totally, let's say in the lab or whatever you're doing, you're coding, et cetera, totally focused. You've been doing it grinding day in, day out. And then maybe you have to take a trip somewhere, you do something different, and all of a sudden things start flowing. You start coming up with ideas that seem to be you haven't seen and I love the, the way that you talk about basically hacking this and taking on another project to reframe your current project. So basically you're just reframing, right? You said more complicated and it can yeah. give you- I, I mean, I, like there's, so there's scales of reframing, right? Yeah. Like for, I, this is a crazy study. Um, they did at Harvard recently where they wanted to know because anxiety and excitement are the same signal. They're both more up and up, right? So the only difference is the frame you put around it so they asked at Harvard, they said, okay, is it easier if you're stressed out to reframe anxiety as excitement, and I'll tell you how to do that in a second, or to use breath meditation, mindfulness, to calm yourself down, right? And they were looking at sympathetic and parasympathetic yeah. response. And they found that breath meditation takes five to seven minutes to calm you down, to get you actually into the point where your brain is released and you have some cognitive freedom, to be creative, to think, whatever. Reframing, literally, all you have to do is think about your problem, the feel, get this feeling for it, the somatic address, and say out loud, I am excited, I am excited, I am excited three times. And literally, because it's the same signal, so oftentimes we're, we're, we'll get the signal and we'll think, oh my God, this is anxiety, I'm feeling anxiety. We're actually a little excited, we're not even noticing it, so just that little step is enough. Three times out loud, How, how's that for fast, you know, reframing? This is the, thing I was doing starting is that's the wow. extreme other side of it, right? So you can go small all the way up to huge in terms of like using your training as a tool. And so that was faster. 
That's why you showed the excitement one was faster? Yeah, I mean, literally, it's the same seconds. three times. Okay. Seven minutes. Yeah. Wow. And it's interesting, this is even crazier. Um, and this is, I don't know if this is exactly true today, but this came out of the research. Women, especially going back 20 years, were not really allowed culturally to feel excitement as much as anxiety. We all, women were stereotypically thought of as more anxious, blah, blah, blah. So what they found with this exercise is a lot of women, especially older women, had no idea that this signal that they've been calling anxiety was actually excitement. And they, nobody ever told them. Wow. So they were like, oh my God, this is excitement. I can feel this. I'm, it literally unlocked whole emotional spectrums for the older women in the study, which I thought was amazing. That is fascinating. And to make it practical for a lot of you have had anxiety before public speaking, you've been told, you know, just turn it into excitement and that didn't really mean anything to you. But I mean, this is scientifically backed. Uh, we'll have to check out that article. So great, great starting point. Um, we talked a lot about flow and this is something that's really, you know, percolated in, in the, ether and become very popular uh, recently, but I want to get your definition of exactly what flow is, um, and and just curious about how you work with it, because I know we have some advanced concepts that you've written about instilling uh, fire, um, but just in terms of flow as a starting point, what is it exactly according to you? So forget according to me, let's just go with the scientific definition yeah. that has been um, established since Csikszentmihalyi did his sort of early work, he wrote a book called or beyond boredom and anxiety in the late 60s, which is where that term gets introduced. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, I, and it means a very specific thing. It is technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness, one where we feel our best and we perform our best. Mm -hmm. More specifically, colloquially, right? There's lots of synonyms, being in the zone, runner's high, being unconscious if you play basketball. If you're a stand-up comic, they call it the forever box. The lingo is essentially endless. But it refers to those moments of rapt attention and total absorption. We're so focused on the task at hand, focused on, focused on the now, everything else just vanishes. Action awareness will start to emerge. Your sense of self disappears. Time dilates, which is a fancy way of saying it passes strangely. So it'll slow down, you're gonna freeze for an effect, and you end up in a car crash. It'll speed up in five hours, like the body like five weeks. And throughout, all aspects of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. And that's that's amazing. So I, I want to start there and then I want to move to this new term. And I always have to look at it to make sure I'm saying it right. Ecstasis. It's not a new term, old term. It's a Greek term. New term, yeah, to me. Sorry. So, and, and you introduced this in the book. And I, I, I want to understand from you the, the difference between that and the traditional flow state you just described. So, well, let's do it historically because it's a little more fun. Yeah. If you go back to kind of the birth of contemporary psychology, neuroscience, whatever, you're going to land on William James, right? Harvard psychologist, philosopher, blah, blah, blah. So William James, 100 years ago, when he was writing Varieties of Religious Experience, pointed out, he said, hey, there's an entire upper spectrum of human experience. There's, it's, it's this whole spectrum that goes from awe, flow states, psychedelic experiences, so-called mystical experiences, out of body, near death, trance states, meditative states, contemplative, etc. This is known this upper possibility space of human experience. It's the Greek term for it was ecstasis. And ecstasis referred to all of these states and it really refers to a state where we get beyond our normal perspective, our normal waking consciousness, and it is an incredibly information rich state. So all it's real all 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 William James is really saying is hey in these states of consciousness we get access to heightened information that we don't get access to under normal circumstances. And this has to do with all of these states amping up the brain's information processing systems. And we can talk about how that happens neurobiologically if you'd like. But their neurobiologically flow, awe, psychedelic experiences, transits, this whole spectrum, this ecstatic spectrum, neurobiologically they have very similar overlapping properties. So they make the same kind of changes to brain waves, right? They shift brain waves, the same kind of neuro, neurochemical release happens. Certainly there's more of X in psychedelic states and more of Y in flow states, but it's the same five or six chemicals and the same kind of shifts to neural anatomical processing and network function, connect on stuff, happen in all these states. So they're very, very, very much related. Um, which is why, for example, we teamed up with Imperial College in London, which is Robin Carr and Harris's lab, where they're doing all the really great work on the fMRI analysis of psychedelics, like uh, uh, 
psilocybin, LSD, DMT, et cetera, et cetera. We're doing a comparison and contrast study between flow states and psychedelic states with them. It's the first of its kind, but based on the overlap in neurobiology, we're, we're comparing a set and setting, which are critical for psychedelic experiences, especially using the experiences for therapy. Right. If you want to, if you want to use them to heal, set and setting are fundamental. We've known this back to the '60s. Um, and we, the flow states have triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. Right. If you want more flow in your life, these are your toolkit. So what we wanted to compare is the set and setting that lead to high therapeutic results um, in psychedelic experiences versus flow triggers, set and setting for flow that lead to high results in flow. And we're just nobody's ever done it, so we're looking at it. Fascinating. And I, I definitely want to talk about the biology. But how can we trigger these states, let's say, without the psychedelic? So like, how, if I wanted to do it you know, so every day, not perform the work. You pulled really. up a graph from our creativity study, yeah. right? And um, let me first say that this was a pilot study. Yeah. The data you guys, it's, it's what we wanted to prove um, was this methodology works, meaning you could retrospectively ask somebody to think about a flow state and prime them into one. Right, and then you could use that to study creativity. And we also wanted, right, so it was very preliminary, let's just test it out, but we've gotten really great results and we like it. And so now we're partnering with USC, we're gonna take this forward and do a whole bunch of stuff. That said, we wanted to know of the 20 known triggers for flow, and there are probably way more, and we'll, I could talk neurobiologically about what those triggers do if you want, but of the 20 known triggers, which are most associated with heightened creativity? Right. If I want more creativity in my life, what are the three, what are the things that matter most? And what we found um, is that there were three attributes, three flow triggers that really matter. The first, not surprising because you got at it, my, you had Cliff Nass's work up first before what was talking about. And, uh, you know, and Cliff, first of all, if you look at his research, well, first thing it shows is that multitasking is a lie. We're all serial taskers. Anybody who tells you they're multitasking is lying to you, right? We can't do it. But the, so the first and the re, and, and flow only shows up when all of our attention is in the here and now, right? So that's all. What all these triggers do is they drive our attention into the now. If I were to say this neurobiologically, I would say they either release dopamine and norepinephrine, which are the brain's two principal focusing chemicals, right? Mm -hmm. Or they lower cognitive load. So all the crap you're trying to think about at once. But, but both things allow you to pay more attention to the present. So the triggers do one of two things. What um, we found for creativity is the first is complete concentration in the present moment. So no cell phone, no internet, no. I get up at four o'clock in the morning and start writing and I don't even have lights in my office. Um, so I can't, I, I, I write in focus view. So if you're not familiar with focus view in Word, it literally just shows you the text. Everything else is blacked out. Literally, I'm in my office. No lights anywhere, there's no phone, internet's turned, everything's off, all I can see is the words, right? And it's four o'clock in the morning, so nobody can call me. Um, or wow. you better have yeah, good reason <laughs> to do something, right? Uh, so complete concentration really, really matters. And so let me make this more practical for great people. Um, when we work with companies, uh, the first thing um, is we tell them, you can't hang a sign on your door that says, be blank off. I'm flowing, you're sunk. You have to be able to, open office plans are terrible. Yeah. Uh, and if you're in that kind of situation, WeWork has got these new little phone booth pods, yeah. right? There's, this is this is about the fact that we can't be distracted, right? The brain doesn't multitask and open office plans are disastrous for performance because they're disastrous for flow. Mm. Um, and just by the way, to put a number on this, just so we have some numbers around this, McKinsey found the top executives in flow are 500% more productive than on flow. Wow. Research done by the Department of Defense found we learn 230 to 500% faster in flow. Research done by the Flow Genome Project done at Harvard, done at the University of Sydney, shows that creativity will bump somewhere between 300 and 500% in flow. Some studies go even higher. That's, by the way, where that creativity study you're looking at came from. The study came out of the University of Sydney where they found flow increases creativity like 430, 60% maybe, I think it was 460%. And we were looking at that number and we were like, that's a crazy freaking, like that's nuts, what the hell? So our study, what we did, one of the things we did, so you saw all those little crosses on the graph. Yeah. What we wanted to do is we broke creativity. There's people break creativity apart in lots of different ways. Guilford did it in a really interesting way. And inside of his breakdown is something called process. Measure, it's a five, it's the five stages of creativity. 
um, idea generation, problem solving, that sort of thing. We measured each of those independently. And we saw each one of those go up 40 to 50% in flow. You start adding those things together and suddenly you're like, oh crap, that's where that 500% boost comes from. Okay, turns out it's real. Um, so complete concentration was the first one. Second one is immediate feedback. The more feedback you can get, right? This is why most jobs suck because you get you know, annual feedback or quarterly feedback, right? And the research shows for creativity, you need it all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you're in that kind of company and you're doing a creative job, get a feedback buddy, get somebody to work with you on this. And we train people to look for what I call the minimal feedback for flow. And it's a really individual thing. But for example, I, there are only three questions I need to know when I'm writing. Is my writing boring, confusing, or arrogant? If I'm doing any of those things, those tend to be indicative of other problems, whatever, it's a writing thing, but yeah. um, it's the minimal feedback I need for flow. So I have somebody on my staff who reads my stuff every couple of days, and all I do is I get a checklist. It's boring, it's arrogant, it's confusing, scale of one, like I know, right? Steer from that. So it doesn't have to be like a big feedback breakdown. Let me tell you how you really do, you know, it's quick and dirty, just enough to steer with. And the last one uh, is the challenge skills balance, often called the golden rule of flow. The most important of flows triggers it says that when we pay the most attention to the task at hand, when the challenge of the task at hand slightly exceeds our skill set, right? And if you look under the hood of that, by the way, a lot of that number, in some studies up to like 80% of that number is actually confidence. So it's not even do I have the skills, it's do I have the confidence in the fact that I, that I think I have the skills. Um, so less about actual skills, though those, you you know, with flow, the closer you get to expert performance, the easier it is to get in the state. So those Fantastic. are the three triggers. And, and let me just, maybe like two tests of, for those three triggers. Let's say, uh, you know, practically you're in a job and you, you're like a project manager. You know, and you know, you have to coordinate with a dozen people to get a project done. And uh, you, you want to get into your flow state, but there's a lot of pinging, you need to go back and forth. I know some software programs can help this, but I'm sure, you know, with all of your uh, yeah, businesses so it's, with, what do you, would you suggest? Is it, is it, you, get, you went right to the heart. I often say, and I just, I actually just said this, I feel, so unless you, so if you go to the Flow Genome Project, the website for the Flow Genome Project, it's flowgenomeproject.com, you'll see a flow profile there. It's a diagnostic. It's built on top of the big five mm -hmm. and the flow triggers and a couple other things. And basically says, if you're this kind of person, you're likely to find flow in these directions. One of the categories is a social flow, right? This is somebody who gets a ton of flow talking to other people. And in fact, wow. early research done by Chick Set Me High, and he had Chick Set Me High when he was at the University of Chicago running the psychology department, sort of the godfather of flow research found that um, middle managers experience a ton of flow at work because they're very social people and there's a lot of right back and forth and it tends to be if you're not wired that way mm. that's a disaster there's there like what i can tell you to do is i or i can't i'm not that i'm not that wired that way so one i never have a meeting with more than three people because i think they're a waste of time um and i can't right like i don't i, I have to keep it small maximize that and I, and I really, like, you have to have a very damn good reason to contact me, um, is because I don't work well that way and I don't like the distractions. So unless you're wired that way, right. you're really going, you know, you're really going to, and that's so like, what I tell people is like, what you have to understand is um, two things here. So 500% more productive, going by McKinsey's numbers, right? That means you could go to work on Monday, spend Monday to flow state, take Tuesday through Friday off and get as much done as everybody else. Two days a week at flow and you're a thousand percent more productive than the company. Yes. This is the point I make to people, which is my organization, this is not top secret information, right? Yeah. The cat's out of the bag. We train a lot of companies up in flow, a lot of other organizations do. My point is chances are if we haven't trained your company up in flow, we've trained your competition up in flow. Mm -hmm. The best of the best are already doing this, mm -hmm. right? What that means is if you're not doing this as an organization or an individual, you're already falling behind. And it's a big behind. And the point of this is if you work for or run a company where you have to respond to text messages in 15 minutes and emails in a half an hour or whatever that crap is, it's a disaster. You're literally doing the very thing that keeps employees from performing at their best. It's just, there's no way around it. Like you can't beat the neurobiology. Uh, it just is what it is. So you have to be very intentional with 
like structures, communication structures, but also you mentioned the big five personality types. And, so, and communication, by the way. Like I always tell people that, especially if you're going into this flow work, first thing to do is have conversations out loud, mm -hmm. right? Like, hey, I like I'm working with the system for optimal performance. It's going to make me a hell of a lot more productive, creative. I'm going to learn better. I'm a better employee. But the only way I can do this is with this kind of stuff. You've got to have those conversations out loud. Also on the backside, because flow is going to put a lot more dopamine and norepinephrine in your system. So you're going to be a little more manic than normal, right? You're going to be a little more than normal. And uh, you should warn people it's coming. My wife likes to know it's coming. That's good. No, no, it's good. Um, and so just, just for those listening, you, you mentioned the big five personality types. And I think this is new to a lot of people. So flow is going to be different to your personality type or where you want to apply it or what puts you in flow is going to be based there on. There isn't the most fantastic research in the world. Yes, is the answer. And what, what, it, what, so it's not even a big five thing more than anything. It's a genetic thing, right? Yeah. And a lot of, so a lot of flow is about risk predilection and that's about how responsible are your dopamine receptors and things along those lines. So there's, you know, 40 percent of this is genetic, and you're just trying to figure out what you know. How did how does that work? Um, and, and you know, sixty percent of it is what environment did you grow up in, kind of thing. And I want to close on this is fantastic. I just want to close on this for our audience. You know, going into the biology a little bit. You know, you mentioned dopamine receptors, for example. Huge differences based on how you know responsive they are in terms of uh, maybe practically the most recent thing I read is people who perform very well in like a live game or match or whatever in sports versus people who practice very well, right? A lot of that comes down to the responsiveness of their dopamine receptors. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about what's happening in your brain when you get into this flow state or when you're out of it or anything interesting that you've read recently uh, about what's happening in your, their, their neurobiology. High performers, low performers, different areas of performance, creativity, anything. So um, you wanna know what's going on in the brain during flow? Yeah, so during that, flow, outside of flow, and then maybe even at these these higher states where you said there's some convergence of flow and, uh, and So stages. what the reason, you don't have to be in flow to perform at your peak. Mm -hmm. You can do it without flow. Though uh, Michael Sachs, who's at Temple University, said uh, years ago, um, I think the quote is in West of Jesus, my second book, actually, um, and, I, and I agree with him on this that um, pretty much every gold medal or world championship that's ever been won, there's a flow state in time, right? Um, you can perform at your best without the state, but it's really unpleasant and it's not repeatable, right? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can win without flow, but not over time. Mm -hmm. um, what happens in the state is, so older idea about high performance, if you're familiar with it, it's a 10% brain, like, hey, we're only using a small chunk of our brain, high performance must be the full brain on overload. That's actually William James being misquoted by Dale Carnegie and then some crazy game of whispers, right, over the years. Yeah. Um, but it's not true at all. And I mean, from an evolutionary pers perspective, evolution is conservative by design. It would never not use 90% of your brain. That's just no. But what we actually now know is that the head of these executive factors in flow at peak performance, we're not using more of the brain, we're actually using less. Mm -hmm. so the technical term for this is what's known as transient hypofrontality, transient meaning temporary, hypo, H-Y-P-O, the opposite of hyper, it means to slow down, shut down, deactivate, frontality, prefrontal cortex, right? So in flow, yard swatches of the prefrontal cortex is downregulating. It's an efficiency exchange. The brain is saying, hey, we need extra energy for attention, so we're gonna shut off non-critical things. This has, by the way, this accounts for what, what is self vanish? Why does time pass so strangely? Self is a calculation performed all over your prefrontal cortex. It works like any network. As parts of that network go down, we lose our sense of self. Huge impact on performance, by the way, because when this goes away, our inner critic, that nagging defeatist always on voice in our head, shuts up, mm -hmm. right? Your inner Woody Allen, Woody goes silent and flow. And um, of course, what you see on the back end of this is creativity spikes, because mm -hmm. you're no longer doubting all your neat ideas. Risk taking also spikes, so fundamental for internal of nourishment, creativity, et cetera, et cetera, right? And emotional experience is liberation, is freedom. We're literally getting out of our own way. Same thing happens to your sense of time, right? Time is a calculation performed all over the prefrontal cortex. Parts of it go down, we lose the ability to separate past from present and future. We plunge into what researchers call the deep now, the eternal present. Mm. Everything right here, that's 
why time slows down or speeds up and flows because the part of your brain that's keeping track of time is gone. So good. Question. One last question: uh, What's the difference between being in a flow state and, and your brain uh, executing that habit routine? Then uh, it sounds very similar in terms of the temporal lobes. I just thought it would be. Yeah, they're exactly. They're very, very similar, and um, in fact, uh, that's exactly what you see, right? Now, um, flow all really shows up. It's rare in novices, right? Like you may get it early on if you're learning a new sport or as it starts to come together. But as a general rule, you need some level of expertise because what happens for in flow is what happens when you've automated a bunch of crap, right? You've taken it, you've turned it into chunks and you've laid those chunks in. Then you've got 15 different chunks that come together and suddenly you're writing at a better, at a higher level, you're thinking as a scientist at a higher level, you're skiing at a higher level. That's flow, it's when all those chunks snap together into a new coherent pattern, mm -hmm. right? That's what's essentially going, one of the things that's going on, yeah. right? Simultaneously with transient hypofrontality, you're seeing a shift in brain waves. And um, this is actually, so brain waves normally we're in conversation right now, our brains are in beta. It's a fast moving wave, right? Mm -hmm. Below that is alpha, it's daydreaming mode. Underneath that is theta, it's where you are in REM sleep, right? And then there's slow wave sleep. Delta is really slow when you're slow wave sleep. Uh, flow takes place on the border between alpha and theta, mm -hmm. right at that borderline. So it drops the brain waves down. Um, you're very calm, you're very creative, you're very insightful, you're very intuitive. But here's what's interesting, and this is, uh, so you don't stay there because flow is an action state, right? It's your every decision, it's called flow because every decision, every action flows seamlessly, perfectly, effortlessly from the last. It's high speed, near perfect decision making, in other words. Mm -hmm. But every time you make a decision, you jump around, you gump up and debate and you go all over the brainwave cycle. What we see in, and this is Dr. Leslie Sheerland's research and I reference it uh, at length in my book, Rise of Superman, if you're curious, um, in top performers, they go through the entire decision-making cycle, all these other states, and they drop back down to the low borderline, that alpha theta borderline, right? Most non-high performers get stuck somewhere along the way, usually up in high beta, they get anxious about something, right? And they can't get back down there. So one of the big differences between experts and non-experts is its ability. And interestingly, one of the things that uh, the research shows, and this is uh, Carol Dweck's work at Stanford on mindset, we talked about mindset earlier. Um, the research shows that if you don't have a growth mindset, if you have a fixed mindset, same thing happens. You, you get locked back out of flow. Because what happens is you make a mistake, and instead of going, oh, this is a chance for me to learn and get better, which is a growth mindset, which will keep you back in flow, Fixed mindsetters will go, oh, crap, I made a mistake. I, I'm so stupid. I'm going to, and you're out. You're done. Yeah. Fantastic. Right? Fantastic. And I think for all of you, you know, if you face a rejection, you let that spin you out of your flow state and, and that growth mindset. Uh, that is actually what's keeping you stuck. Um, really appreciate your time, Stephen. Thank you so much for being on with us. Please thank Stephen in the chat box. I'm going to show uh, his books a couple of time, uh, more times here, a couple of more websites, I should say. He has a, a lot of books. If you want to go to the heart of everything that he has, go to stephencotler.com, stephencotler.com. You scroll down, it shows uh, some of his talks. He's given an incredible TED talk. You can see The Rise of Superman here on the left, Stealing Fire, Tomorrowland, Bold. He's written um, extensively using that app that he talked about in Word, which I'm gonna have to try. Uh, you can go to get his uh, book, Stealing Fire. I highly recommend this. If, if you're interested today, check out this book right now. We'll put the link in the chat box. Um, get on the waiting list for The Last Tango in Cyberspace as well, coming out in May. And please, again, thank Stephen in the chat box if you haven't already. Visit him on LinkedIn. Uh, on his website, I should mention there's a lot of uh, free downloads. And Stephen, what was the name of that uh, test they could take to see what kind of uh, what things put oh, in it's not a, that's not on my website that's on the flow genome project website okay perfect. flow genome project.com um and it just it says right up front it says flow profile it's one of the uh largest studies ever run in optimal site by the way um and interestingly for your audience and then i'll shut up and go away um we used to think flow was mostly associated with uh peak performers athletes and artists and it turns out the largest category, like 43% of our respondents of like over 80,000 people find the most flow doing knowledge work. 
So what every PhD listening to your show wow. does for a living actually is the highest flow category. Okay. And I don't think it'll be a surprise to, to many of you. So um, getting in that state is a good thing. And again, Stephen, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate you staying on extra too. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a great day. All right, thank you all. Uh, please again, thank Stephen if you haven't already, and definitely go over to his LinkedIn page, send him a kind note. Uh, we, I always, I enjoy getting the emails or messages back from guests we've had on, and they're always like, your audience is so engaged. I had 100 people message me on LinkedIn. Uh, whether that's a good or bad thing for them, uh, I don't know yet, but please message and uh, tell him thank you, and definitely check out one of his books. Let him know what book um, you ended up getting Go to his website take the quiz too uh, i'm going to go take this right after the show to the flow genome project.com slash flow dash profile and it looks like it's a very very simple uh, quiz to take it actually shows you as you go through it um, how many people you have left so again thank you very much steven thanks steven in the chat box if you haven't we're going to jump right into our next guest ranjani Mural ida haram Hi, Ron Johnny. How are you? I want to make sure that I'm saying your last name right and then you can say it for me. How are you? Hi. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you. Thanks for waiting to come on with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Are you working right now? Yes, I'm at work. I got out. So we're taking you out of that flow state, but hopefully we'll put you into another flow state as we start talking. <laughs> um, great to see you. Please say hi to Ron Johnny in the chat box if you would. Really, really fortunate to have Ranjani on. I'm going to show her bio here. Um, I'm going to pull it up. I'm going to show her uh, LinkedIn profile as well. Very, very fortunate to have her on to talk to us about um, her career track. Uh, Ranjani completed her PhD in analytical chemistry at the University of South Florida. She then worked in environmental remediation as a scientist. Ranjani recently transitioned into a new role as a quality manager and cosmetic chemist at Malibu Wellness. In her spare time, she likes to volunteer at soup kitchens and medical camps uh, at homeless shelters. And you can connect with Ranjani here on her LinkedIn profile. I just connected with you, Ranjani, so we always have one connection, but I'm guessing you'll have more. And again, thanks for being here. Well, thank you. So I, I wanted to start by asking you how you learned about this quality manager career track. Oops. How did you learn about this quality manager career track? What was your initial touch point in terms of making this, this transition to this promoted role? So originally when I applied for this role, uh, it was a cosmetic chemist. So they had advertised as a cosmetic chemist and uh, since I had worked in a pharmaceutical, not a cosmetic industry before, so I thought this would be a good transition for me. Uh, so when I came in and I had the interview, and they looked at my resume. I had a lot of other things that I had experience with, which is like making SOPs, writing workflows in my previous company. So they thought that I, I was not, not just like, a, I can be hired, I can do more than being a chemist also. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have to thank Tiki for tweaking my resume and <laughs> making it look, I had like a three page resume. Thanks to you guys, I brought it down to whatever it was. So uh, so then they actually changed the role. They made it the quality manager and cosmetic chemist after having the interview. Originally, it was just the advertised for a chemist. I, so thank you, there's a lot of information there. So number one, the role is advertised as chemist. So for those of you looking for very specific job titles, that's about the best you're gonna get. You might even just get scientist, which was uh, Ron Johnny's first role. Um, and you know, I want to circle back real quick. So what was the, I guess that first touch point, did you hear about this job through somebody or you saw it, up, it online? So no, I had applied to Kelly Scientific, yes. uh, which is like a research company, and they did not even give me the name of the company in the beginning. They just said it's a cost, uh, it's a product development chemist. So then after my first round, then I came to know I'm going to be in cosmetics and they asked me if I was open to get out of the pharmaceutical industry. I, and I was, I wanted to, I, it was very interesting for me. So uh, that's how I got this job. So it was through Kelly Scientific, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's great because sometimes you're looking for one job and another opportunity opens up and you shouldn't close yourself off from seizing that uh, opportunity just because it's not what you started off with because these things can be very fluid and dynamic 
doing your job search. Even the title itself, as we just heard from uh, Johnny, was very uh, dynamic. They changed it on the spot when they heard about her other experiences. What challenges besides your resume? And I always, I always like to start with the challenges because we have a lot of people who are, you know, working on their job search right now. Besides your resume, was there other technical challenges? And then besides technical challenges, was there any kind of mindset challenges you were having in your job search at any point? So when I started, uh, the thing is first is resume, right? After that, uh, when I started the association, I did not know LinkedIn plays, plays a big role too. So, uh, so tweaking the uh, when I tweak when I made my LinkedIn profile the way it is today, uh, after all the feedback I got back from CP, like people started contacting me. Before that, there was not, you know, I I, I have shared this before, but I went from like 220 contacts to 350 contacts in like one month, mm -hmm. just because I. I, like, I did not send requests to anybody. Like it was just like people started contacting me because I think now we live in an internet world. Everybody is on LinkedIn. Everybody's on Facebook. So, uh, so I feel that. Uh, so that's another thing for me uh, is that LinkedIn profile. Yes. Yes. And then how? And, no, go ahead, please. No, and also the spreadsheet. You wow. you know the because uh, I think this. I think everything, as we, you know, each module in the team, you told about how, you know, it's not just the big companies, you know, because I live in, in a place where everybody's like, oh, do you work at the Eli Lilly? Do, I, do you work at Dow? Because those are the big companies in the area I live, which is Indianapolis. But that, you know, there are like, there are so many other companies, like this opportunity is like perfect for me, where I am right now. And so, so it's, you know, the module where you share about looking in the local companies other than, you know, researching the, so I think that's also, so there's so many different things uh, <laughs> I can get going on. No, but, no, this is great. I mean, it's important, right? So, so obviously your professional profiles are crucial. Um, resume, LinkedIn, you got to get those right. But also, you know, I'm glad you brought up, we call it the job search strategy spreadsheet, kind of a long name, but essentially yeah. what it is, it's just a way to keep track of your job leads. And going from yeah. going after one job lead at a time to many, changing that threshold. You should be going after yeah. 30, 40 different jobs. And and the fact that there's more jobs out there than just the one or two big companies near you. You don't realize it because you just haven't dug in to, to doing the research. But there's hundreds at least of jobs that are hiring you right now. Biotech, med space, CROs. You just have to search in your area and you'll find them online. And so my next question yeah. is with the mindset. So what was the... What are the struggles you had in your mindset initially when you first wanted to work in industry? Was it was it kind of a black box for you? Did you not really know where you would fit in? Did you were you a little bit nervous about rejection? Anything like that come up for you? So, of course, I was looking to be a scientist because that's what I've been doing for the last uh, I don't know how many years, like eight years. So I always thought that as a PhD, all I could do is work in a lab, be do the chemistry which I'm really good at. Uh, but then when I when I looked at the I don't know the name of the I'm, I'm not using the right spreadsheet names but <laughs> maybe it's been a it's been a while I'm not that active in the group now but uh, but the you know the spreadsheet wherein you know as a PhD the, the different areas that you can go um, which made me realize that it's not just doing you know just being in the lab which I I love doing but I can even grind out like right now. Uh, Although, you know, I am a cosmic owner, I'm also the quality manager. So, you know, I, I'm leading the quality assurance, quality control for all the production that happens. So, you know, there, there's more than, yeah. that was a big mindset thing. I was like, all I, I'm good at is doing chemistry. Mm -hmm. But uh, but the thing is, you know, as a scientist, because you are doing, you you develop all other qualities too, which can get, get you to other careers mm -hmm. in science. Yeah, and I think for a lot of PhDs, we think, okay, whatever I have done in the past is all I can do in the future. Um, whatever yeah. my title was in the past, those are the only titles I can fill. But like you've shown, you can get into management roles, you can work away from the bench, there's lots of different possibilities, and open yourself up to this, going back to that growth mindset that Stephen talked about, that is going to help you um, really get into a flow state when it comes to your job search, because you're not going to get into that limited mindset, again, you're going to have that growth mindset, so that's... That's really one of the first steps to priming yourself to enjoying the job search process and to seeing it as 
right? Uh, something riddled with excitement rather than anxiety. So on the job now, I'm, I'm curious, so other people can understand what you do, right? And we hear about quality insurance or quality roles, you're a quality manager, cosmetics, etc. Just at your company, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? And it can be, you know, maybe on a week-to-week -week basis if that helps, whether it's meetings, you know, maybe more of the kind of the technical work you have to do, if there's certain writing, uh, if certain things you have to write or prepare, what other departments you interact with, I'm curious. Okay. So as, uh, as my responsibilities in the current job, of course, the first thing is I am a cosmetic chemist. So, uh, at some, but, uh, you know, formulation for cosmetics is very different than how it happens for drugs. So uh, I'm, I'm learning to be a cosmetic chemist, which is good because I have two really amazing chemists. One has been in this field for 35 years, just doing cosmetics and the other is more than 10. 10 years so uh be so be as a team i'm trying i'm trying to be in the lab to learn how to formulate all the different skin care hair care products uh, they have shampoos dyes every all different kinds of products here so that's one role and then the other one is a uh, quality manager so what happens is when i come in in the morning first thing i do is go and check if everything is set for the production to happen so are the you know it's not like the components and stuff, but more of the quality perspective. If everything is matches what it says, it should be what, for example, if the shampoo is being made, if it goes in the right bottles and how are, so looking at the production floor, uh, different parts in the production floor, the packaging and the filling, the making of the product, just making sure everything is right for them to get started. And during the day also, I have to go every hour and make sure everything is running the way it should be running. Mm -hmm. So that's, so, so a lot of uh, varying number of hats, but it's it's very, it's a good learning and I enjoy doing it. It's like, I get to be a part of the lab also, and also get a bigger perspective. Like if I make a product, I'm gonna make in a smaller batch, but then when it gets approved, it's gonna be, you know, zoomed up and they're going to make a pilot batch and then they're going to make 4,000 pounds of that shampoo, which was formulated in the lab. And that, so then they, that it gets filled in the bottle, it goes to the customer. And if, you know, if they're happy, sometimes the customer gets back, oh, this is not right. Then we try to reformulate it. So it's like big picture and not just being in the lab doing, you know, I, I go to the beginning. I, I, I don't go, but I get a perspective from the beginning to the end. Perfect. So you, you get to work in the lab, but you also get to have this manager role where you're seeing what's going on in connection to a product through development and then manufacturing and as it goes to market, uh, marketing uh, tasks uh, you know, as well. I think that's fantastic. And what about career trajectory? So you do this on a day-to-day. -day. Where where do you where are you headed? Like who's vertically above you that's that's guiding you as a, as a manager? Um, where could you go laterally? Where have you seen other people uh, transition uh, from this role? So uh, I think where I transition is where I decide where I want to go because for me the opportunity is like, I, I mean, in, in this sense, I I can there is no limit to where I can be in this in the current organization. I feel that I will decide where is the limit. It's how much I put in. If 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 I am going to do really well, you know there might be people working under me, they might hire somewhere else to do what I'm doing and I might go on a higher to a higher position. So the career trajectory so I'm already being the manager, but I can so I I, I don't know a, a title or something, but I just feel that uh, there's there is uh, no kind of uh, a cap to where I can go. It's just that because I just started so I can I decide where I want to go ahead in this role. I want to go up in this role. So you can go up or laterally, right? And and what are the position titles of the person above you in your department? Or what are some of the other position titles that you work with on a daily basis? Okay, the person I refer to is the director. Uh, he's the director of compliance and quality management. Perfect. And what are some of the people that you work with on a day-to-day, -day, like more in those cross-functional, like lateral roles in other departments? Just curious, yes, so every I, company's different. Yeah, so I work with a chief scientific officer who is in the lab and then work with the production manager, 
uh, work with the inventory manager and also so I'm also in touch with the director of the company so uh, and of course the field the manufacturing plant the people who you know do all the manufacturing I am in touch with them so I interact with close to 15 10 to 15 people on a daily to day basis yes mm -hmm. That's very helpful. So really, I appreciate you painting a picture of, of this particular career track and then how you got into it. Uh, thank, and then thank you for joining us you know, in the middle of the winter when you're out there again. I really appreciate it. Um, oh, thank you. It's great to see you again. Please thank Ranjani in the chat box, if you would, for being on with us. It's great to be able to weave in and out of, of hearing you know, these, these leadership-oriented theoretical talks and then talking practically about career roles and how to apply them. So again, please thank Ranjani if you haven't yet. Please head on over to her LinkedIn page and connect with her if you have not done so already. I'll show her LinkedIn page one more time. We'll put the link in the chat box and we will see you in the group. Ranjani, thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, this takes us to the end of the public live streaming show. For those of you watching us, thank you for joining. Just one more reminder, next, tomorrow, not next week, tomorrow, on Thursday, Thursday, January 17th, we are doing two live shows of our LinkedIn webinar. This is our advanced LinkedIn webinar, 12 LinkedIn strategies for getting hired in industry for PhDs only. Go to chiefdescientist.com slash PhD dash LinkedIn dash strategy. We will see you next week with another live radio show. Uh, thank you all again for, for joining. Um, the, our live shows run Wednesdays. 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm thinking, I, I think next week, we actually skip next week. Our next radio show is, let's see, Marrier, Lindsay, help us here. Our next radio show, January 30th, Wednesday, January 30th, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have a great show then, so make sure you join, a, join us. Thank you all for watching us live. We'll see you 